to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And i got to tell you something, people. Uh, there's not a lot of TV me and Joanne watch together, but we always make sure we watch Law & Order on the Thursdays. And my guest was on it, and, and what's funny is I reached out to him many years ago on Twitter because I knew of him, and I think at the time he was on Army Wives, Brian McNamara, who's been on the show. But I reached out to him because I was watching a rerun, and I can't remember what show it was, but he was down near the water, and I think he got killed. And I said, that guy, I like that guy. So I looked him up, and I hit him up on Twitter, and we communicated for a little bit, but then you, I think you were in South Carolina, and we, I, uh -huh. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I was still in L.A., recording it or I was back east then but anyway my guest is Terry Serpico how you doing Terry hey good uh, good afternoon good morning good evening wherever you are now, now do you remember I, I can't think what show it was I just remember you're down on a dock and and, and you got shot oh yeah <laughs> what the, down on a dock was it Maybe it was uh, that thing with Poppy Montgomery oh uh, yeah yeah uh, unforgettable it was unforgettable, unforgettable. <laughs> maybe go. that was it yeah All right. So, uh, yeah. so, so I got to just, let's, let's talk about law and order first. I want to talk about your career, but you've been on law and order and you've, uh, how did the, how did that role start? And when it started, was it, you know, you've, you've been on a few different variations of law and order. Uh, yeah. I, if you take the, uh, the franchise as a whole, I've been on, I've portrayed seven different characters, um, from in all the platforms, like, uh, from the criminal intent to special victims unit to the mothership. Um, um, but this one came about, uh, playing, uh, chief of detectives, Tommy McGrath on, uh, the last few seasons of special victims unit. Um, I was up in Beacon, New York, uh, standing in my garden, puttering around. And, uh, my agent calls and says, where are you? Because at the time I was kind of splitting myself between South Carolina and, and New York. Um, and I said, well, I'm in the garden. <laughs> she says, no, no, no. What, what state is it? Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm in New York. She says, can you, can you be in the city in an hour? They want to COVID test you. And I was like, uh, no, I can't be in the city in an hour, but I, I can be there in like three hours. Um, and she's like, all right, let me get back to you. She calls me back. Says, all right, yeah. Can you get down there? And uh, cause they, they want you to start working tomorrow. I was like, wait, who, who's they? Right. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's law and order special victims unit. They, they, you know, they had somebody, uh, who actually caught COVID somebody who was, who was in the role who, um, contracted COVID and was unable to work. And this was in the, the midst of our, our COVID joy and wonder. Um, and so, uh, I went down there and I tested and I went back the next day, went to work. Um, and it was supposed to have been a couple episodes you know, where I was playing the chief of detectives and we were, we were running our, uh, the, the, the current head of, of SVU, uh, Demore Barnes, I think played the, played the role. I forget the character's name, but, um, he had, he had run afoul of the administration somehow. And so they were, I was, I was the administration that he was, that he had run afoul of. Um, and so uh, it was supposed to have been a couple episodes where they kind of moved him along and brought someone else in. And then I just, uh, I stayed, I refused to leave. And so they, they found things for me to do. <laughs> now, now that you said they called and it was an offer. Now at your point in your career, do you get mostly offers or do you still audition? Cause I know people like that still like Patrick Fabian, he still auditions and he was on better call Saul, who you probably ran into on auditions all the time in LA. But, uh, but do you still do you get do you still audition or, or are you getting all offers now? God, I wish I could say it was offers, but no, sir. I audition um, the way I always have. You know, you go and you you your agent sends you uh, an audition request, and you know, should you uh, should you accept the assignment? You know, this is this is this is your mission. Um, and so I yeah, the, my agent sends me the submission. Uh, uh, audition requests and I try to fulfill those requests as best as I possibly can to the best work that I can between my, my wife and myself at uh, most the, the vast majority of the time at this stage of the game in this industry is uh, self tapes at home. So, you know, we move the living room furniture around, and, <laughs> you know, make room and hang the backdrop on the wall and set up the cameras and the lights and do the whole nine yards. But, um, very rarely, even still, very rarely do it. Is it just a straight offer? 
um, occasionally if it's if it's the kind of guy that I I have made a living playing, and um, you know hopefully we all know what that is. But I generally have uh, that that kind of assholey command presence, um, which thankfully I I'm, I'm pleased to say I I get out all of that in my work. That's that's not me personally by any stretch of the imagination really. Um, Although I must have my moments, I guess. We all do. Um, but yeah, uh, so we, we uh, I taped them uh, at home and, uh, you know, kind of, as is the nature of the business, kind of go with hat in hand and say, okay, here's here's the work that I've done. Do you want me to do it on your show? Yeah. Now, now, personally, and I, I've asked a lot of actors this, and there's different answers. Do you prefer... In room, a lot of actors who've been around for a while like the in room because that's how they came out. Because there was no, there was another thing you know, a long time ago, and then you know, but some of them do like to self tape, but they always like to spot noted being in room with the producers. What do you prefer? I mean, because you've gone on a ton of auditions, but what do you like better? Oh, goodness. Um, I guess I'd have to say at this point that I, I, I like the self tape better because that is that is the industry standard at this point. Um, and also you do have the luxury of being able to, uh, prepare at your leisure, um, given, if you're given enough time to prepare the material, um, you don't have to travel to get there. So there's that, that stress element is removed. Uh, you don't have to worry about getting there on time. You don't have to sit there in the waiting room for two hours cause they're running behind. Um, you don't have to deal with other actors who are pacing in front of you, learning their lines or, or, you know, doing their shtick. Um, and then you get one more than one crack at it, which, you know, when you're in the room, you can generally say, like, can I try that again? And they're more than willing because everybody wants you to do well. Uh, and they want you to do well on self-tapes as well. So I, I find that um, I like self-tapes a little better at this point. And it may just be because I've, I haven't had an in-person in so long. Um, I... I always enjoy auditioning. I still enjoy the audition process because it gives me and my wife an opportunity to work a little bit together and to 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 kind of do a little bit of work. It's you know it's it's something to do, um, and it's it, the the exploration is joyful. But um, I, I'm not sure that I miss uh, traveling to get to uh, small little rooms uh, to stand on the other side of a desk. And, uh, and and try to impress somebody. Now, now you met your wife on Law and Order, right? We did. We met on on the set of Special Victims Unit. Now I want to hear this because it's funny. You just said I always play an asshole character, so she probably didn't. I mean, I don't know if she knew before, but she's probably like, man, this guy's an asshole. And you know, uh, tell, tell me, how did you guys meet? I mean, this is great. How did you guys meet? Um, we, it was in a scene. We were in a, we were in a scene together. Um, I was giving a press conference as was the common occurrence with uh, with Tommy McGrath. And uh, so I'm standing at a podium speaking to the press, and then I pass the mic to my colleague, Olivia Benson. So I step back to let Marish get into the podium, and as I step back, I step on this young lady's foot. I literally stepped on her foot. And, you know, we call cut eventually. And so I had the opportunity to apologize for stepping on her foot. Had I not had that reason to speak to her, I probably would not have said a thing because I have zero game and she's just gorgeous. And I was, I was, you know, kind of flabbergasted and flummoxed. Um, but we started talking in between takes and in, in between setups and, um, we had a lovely conversation. This was still during COVID, so masks were on and stuff. But at one point, I kind of stepped back and I took my mask down because there was just something I just wanted her to see me, not to try and impress her with all that is me because it ain't all that. But I just wanted her to see me. And I think I still want her to see me every day, you know, just the real me. At any rate, um, at the end of the day, she just fucked off. She just disappeared it's like like i meant nothing <laughs> at any rate um i found out uh her, her contact information through her uh through her manager and i left an email with her manager saying hey look i just met your client today on set we had a lovely conversation i'd like to continue that conversation here is my information should she like to get in touch with me and uh katia got back to me uh a few days later and said 
Oh well, it was nice to nice to talk to you. Thanks for getting in touch. You know, it was kind of like a very. Um, so it, it 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 took us a little a little time to get to the point where um, she she said, "Okay, uh, give me a call," because I texted back and forth a couple of times. I'm like, "Oh dear." So I call her and she says, "Look, uh, I had asked her out. She wants to go have a drink." She says, "I don't drink." <laughs> okay, I don't date people on set. Okay, and I'm not interested in getting into a relationship. Okay, I'm down with that. <laughs> I was like, okay, anything else? Um, so we, we we dated about a month later, and then she she went to visit her family in in Europe, and and uh, came back, and we started dating in earnest, and and um, then we were married within the year. That's awesome. You know, you said about pandemic. Me and my wife got married, and six months later, we went into lockdown. And it was one of those things, you know, it was like, thank God, oh, wow. thank God we've been together for a while and she moved to L.A. with me and then we moved back. But it was weird. I, I could just imagine what it would be like dating during COVID. I mean, as you said, you have a mask on you. People can't see you. I mean, it must right. have been it must have been very it must have been very an odd time. Like we were confined to, to the condo and we were fine with that. Right. So we got along. But it must have been a weird time if you were unattached at that moment. Well, um, this was as COVID was kind of re releasing its grasp. To, a, to an extent, we were starting to, uh, you know, and certainly on set when you're filming, the masks come off. So, um, but uh, COVID was starting to wane at that point. So when we started dating, it was kind of masks optional at that point. So we were able to uh, to kind of get good looks at each other. And that's 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 why it it happened so fast by uh, most people's standards we moved very quickly by our own standards we moved very deliberately we we asked very pointed once we got to the point where we realized okay there's no major red flags here right let's go ahead and and is it okay if we fall in love with each other oh well, yeah okay let's do that and that it was a process of asking some very pointed and particular questions because we'd both been there before we'd both been married and divorced both have kids it was you know um and so we we felt pretty comfortable that we knew what we were getting into with one another, uh, and yet there's still um, there's still some mystery because we're still getting to know each other. So there's 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 a I'm just oh my goodness I'm just so grateful that you know it's like the creator was like dude she's right there do I have to have you trip over her to see her she's right there it's like right right behind you right behind you. and I tripped her so. You've been acting for a long. Here. You've been acting for a long time. How did you get into yeah. acting? Now, I, I saw somewhere. You, were you a military brat? I was an army brat. Yes, sir. Okay, so I want to ask you: Do you think that's one of the reasons why you may have gotten into acting? Because you probably moved a lot, and whenever you go to a new school, it's like you're auditioning because yeah. people don't know you. I mean, how many schools did you go through from elementary to high school? Oh, jeez. Um, let me see. I made I made six moves between when I was born and when I got to high school. So um, that must have been at least four or five different schools of some sort, whether from nursery school or elementary school to to uh, middle school and then high school. Um, but yeah, I was born in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, moved to uh, Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. Moved to Fort Carson in uh, Boulder, Colorado, or Colorado Springs. Um, Moved to Peden Barracks in West Germany. Um, then moved to Fort McPherson in Atlanta, which is now Tyler Perry Studios. Um, then uh, we moved to Malvern, Pennsylvania. Uh, and my father retired at that point um, and immediately took a job overseas. <laughs> he didn't know how to be home very well. Um <laughs> And so I was I was fortunate enough to be able to go to junior high and high school in the same school system. My brother and sister, both older, both went to two apiece. So, I mean, moving in the middle of your junior high or high school years is is, uh, is difficult, to say the least, and they had to do it twice. Um, so I, 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 uh, I grew up in, it, I say my hometown is pretty much Malvern, Pennsylvania, which is west of Philly. Um, 
and it was there in my sophomore year. My freshman year, I went to see the, the school musical, and I was a three sports a year athlete. I mean, all 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 year athlete, whatever, anything that had a ball or a racket or a glove, or I was on it. You know, I would. Um, and I went to see the musical, and there were like it looked like they were having a great time, and there were really there were like cute girls on stage and leotards and stuff, and I thought, wow, that's great. And I bet they have great parties. <laughs> so the the next year I auditioned for the show, the musical, and I got the role of Snoopy in Year of Good Man Charlie Brown. So I was like up to my neck in theater. And uh, I found my tribe. Um, and eventually, you know, I balanced sports and, and, and theater through high school. Uh, but by the time I was a senior, I was... Uh, I was full on doing theater, and we did, you know, all the shows from the musicals to, I did choreography, I did set design, construction, I was just like in it, you know, um, and then went to uh, Boston University for a couple of years, right out of right out of high school, um, got cut from their program, uh, it was a kind of, there's a, a, a group of schools around the country, I'm not sure if the league still exists, but it was the League of Professional Theater and Training Programs. And uh, part of their MO was that they would reduce their, their student numbers every year uh, in their conservatory environment to try to increase their student to, to teacher ratio and, you know, make it, a, you know, a smaller company moving forward year after year. Either way, I was on the outs at BU after, two, after my sophomore year, uh, kicked around Europe for a while, came back uh, and went to SUNY Purchase and got my degree from SUNY, graduated in 89 with my my BFA and moved to the big city. Now, now when you were in college, did you know this was going to be your career path? Because, you know, sometimes people will go for acting and then they get out and they go, holy shit, this is really hard. You know, they don't expect it because in school a lot of times they don't tell you, hey, here's what you have to do. They don't tell you how to get an agent or how to deal with the rejection. So, I mean, no, they don't. <laughs> exactly. So a lot of times, like, I think a lot of people will go to school thinking, you know, let's say they get into a good program, and they're like, oh, this is a cakewalk. Oh, man, I'm, you know, and then all of a sudden they get in the real world, and they go, I can't get an agent. What am I going to do? When did you know right. you wanted it to be your, when you went to college, did you say, I'm going to be an actor, or and you weren't going to look back, or did you have second thoughts, or what? Oh, man. When I chose to go to school for acting, it was a ridiculously unconscious decision. I don't know what I was thinking, quite honestly. I had been I had been doing this in high school and it, it really flipped my switch and I just so when I started looking for colleges I was just looking for theater training programs I didn't really make a conscientious effort to say oh, okay this is what I want to do I'm going to be an actor I'm going to pursue this and I'm going to be you know the next big star it was just like oh this is what I'm doing okay um, and I continued to go along in that thoughtless kind of <laughs> la da 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 just stumbling down the road uh, until I graduated SUNY Purchase. And then I, you know, um, realized that, that well, at, at that point, when I graduated SUNY, uh, we had this kind of presentation at the end of our training, uh, at the end of four years. So all the, the league schools would kind of send their graduating classes to New York. And we would do a performance. We would do a, a presentation for an invited audience of agents and managers and producers and whomever wanted to come um, to see the, the the new crop of talent from these exclusive, uh, rigorous training programs. So it wasn't a bad place for somebody looking for talent to go, right? So I came out of that. I was I was fortunate, as most of us were in those programs, uh, to come out of that with offers from agents. So I chose to go with uh, with Abrams Artists, which was now A3, and I believe A3 is no longer as of uh, a couple of few weeks ago. Um, it kind of imploded. Uh, but I was with Abrams for a little while and then got dropped by Abrams and then was with them and them and them and them and bounced around until eventually I ended up with, with Don Buckwald and Associates, and I've been with them for, I uh, God, almost almost 20 years maybe. Now, now, when did you start getting work? I mean, you, know, you look at your IMDb and it shows you're in, you know, in Copland and you're all these movies that, but you know, but when did you start actually getting work where you, you know, you knew, well, you knew you get your SAG card. I mean, when did you, when did you, did you get your SAG card on a gig or how did you get your SAG card? 
I did. I I traded my SAG card for my services on Donnie Brasco in 1997. Um, the money that I made to do that movie went to pay for my my dues membership. Basically, it was just like it was almost like an even trade. I think at the time. Um, but that was 97. I had gotten out of school in 89. So those intervening years were what it took me to get to a point where I booked my first major film and it's it's been uh trying to book ever since doing whatever work i have to do working um uh, on my audition technique working on everything uh just plugging away ever since uh but once i got out of school in 89 and i had some representation and i i again i bounced around a little bit through reps um and I booked some soap operas that were still working at that time in New York, which dates me. <laughs> um, and I booked some, you know, some small stuff, but nothing major. Um, and I was ten and bar at the time. I was, I was, you know, busy ten and bar. And I met my first wife. And you know, it was just uh, got to a point where it's like, you know what? Just screw this. I'm not. I'm done. I'm, I'm not doing this. I just want to go live on the beach and raise babies you know hell with this and then i booked donnie brasco and i was like you know what i came here to do this so let's give this the shot that it deserves because i'd hate to have that toxic what if you know uh simmering under the rest of my life so um i think one of the things that really moved the the needle in the direction of staying in the industry was the fact that I met George Aguilar, who was the stunt coordinator on Donnie Brasco. And in the scene with, with Al Pacino and Johnny Depp, <laughs> and I get to say that, my first scene in a major movie was with Al Pacino and Johnny wow. Depp. Wow. I mean, you th when you wow. think back, yeah, I mean, it's funny. This, wow. You know, when you think back, and I, you know, it's like when I talked to some people who said, oh, I was in these pilots and didn't get picked up. And I'm like, but you were in those pilots. I mean, like for you, even if you never acted again, just to be able to sit there and look back and go, oh, yeah, I was I was in yeah. a movie with yeah. a, a scene and people were like, oh, yeah, you're full of crap. And like, oh, no, and they watched it. And they go, oh, my God, Terry, you you were in that scene. Yeah, I was. It was Fugazi. Hey, <laughs> hey, what's a Fugazi? Um, yeah, Pacino, man, We I, I went in and I was uh, one of the New York actors that was able to come to his office in the, the pre-production stage and read through the script with him and John and, and, you know, various other actors. Um, and Pacino first met me and he's, he's not feeling well. He's got the flu or something. He comes up to me and says, is that really your name? <laughs> like, yeah, that's my name. You know, it's like, look at me. Would you, would I change my name to Serpico if I was going to change it to something? <laughs> but I told him, it's like, you're, you're like an honorary member of the family, man. You know, because he played Serpico right. all those years ago. And then Sidney Lumet, and then I got to work with Sidney Lumet again years later um, and worked with him several times. Um, but yeah, I, I met George Aguilar on the set of, uh, of Donnie Brasco. I was getting my ass kicked in that scene. And he's like, you get your ass kicked really well, man. You should give me your resume. I'll get you some work. Um, and he booked me on just about everything he could after that. Uh, I became one of his stunt players in his stable of guys, guys and girls. And, um, so I got to do a bunch of like big movies, uh, from behind the velvet rope. I got, I got in through a back door. You know, as a stunt player, and it turns out that it was a nice little niche of like a stunt player who could act, who could deliver lines. So, you know, a lot of that would fall to me. Um, and so I was able to kind of pad my resume and start building a reel and start understanding the, you know, how sets work and the etiquette of it and how to apply my my craft while still, uh, you know, being a, a good team player. And um so I'm very grateful to George and to to the other members of the stunt community that became my friends and mentors. Now, was there ever, ever a time that you thought about just going full blown stunt? Because you know, if it's con, oh, yeah. if, it's, if it's if it's as I said, it's you know, you're in with this guy, you're good at what you do, and you know how to act. So you you have a certain level, and it's work. I mean, bottom line is, you know, it's all it's you're gonna it's, always work. So did you ever sit there and go, I think I might just stop the following the acting and just follow the per, you know stunt because i can move up the ladder and maybe end up being a stunt coordinator did that ever cross your mind it certainly did yeah it certainly did there was a there was a period of time there when i thought uh maybe i'd go to my my friend plays corrigan 
who's a, a stunt coordinator and was uh, George's right hand for a long time, um, and say, "Hey, Blaze, you know, like kind of, kind of learn me up here. Let's uh, let's let, let's follow that." Um, but uh, it's hard on the body. <laughs> it's uh, stunt stunt work uh, is supposed to look dangerous, not be dangerous, but you can still get pretty banged up. Um, and I took a couple of knocks and, and it's like, okay, um, maybe this isn't a, a long-term job prospect. And also at that point, things started to move on the acting front. So um, it became apparent that um, my energies kind of needed to go there. Um, you know, there's there's still days when I think, geez, maybe I should have just become a stunt coordinator. I'd still be, you know, going to the mailbox and and pulling checks from all those movies that I, you know, that I, you know, had a hand in. Um, I think I, I imagined for years that so many of these uh, these stunt players that you see, you know, sometimes I can see them in movies and I'm like, oh, somebody, he, he's going to get punched in the face. You watch, because <laughs> I know that guy and he always gets punched in the face. <laughs> but <laughs> he goes to his mailbox and it's just stuff full of residuals because of all the movies that they've done. When I when I lived in L.A., I actually met a guy at a bar who who was a stunt man, but he had a stunt horse, and he said, "There's oh. not a lot of them." So the the horse knew how to take a fall, and he goes, "The horse gets paid more than me." He said, "Because yeah. when they he goes when you watch the movies, he goes, there's not that many people who have." And it fascinated me because I'm like, so someone sat there and trained this horse to take a fall, and the horses get more work than the owner, and the owner's probably like, "Gee, I went well. It's better his yeah, body right. than mine." I I'd, I'd met uh, like like stunt players who used to be cops or something like that and said, you know, I got more money pretending to be a cop than being a cop. <laughs> and, you know, people don't shoot real bullets at me in this job. Exactly. So, so, so you're acting. What, when do you feel that your, your career is starting to get momentum? I know you were recurring on Rescue Me, but when was, what was like the job that you sat there and said, this, okay, I'm, I'm feeling good about this. I'm still waiting for that job. <laughs> You know, I, 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 I wish that was, that was funny. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that's kind of the curse of the actor in so many ways is that, that we're, we're always waiting for that, that sense of security, that sense that, oh, okay, I've, I've made it or, um, you know, I, I don't have to worry at this point. It's still, it's still a hat in hand industry. But um, in answer to the question, probably Army Wives was uh was a big uh, well it was a huge turning point for me uh to to book a show and then to become a series regular on that show really moved me several rungs up the catch-22 ladder um and um gave me the confidence after you know over 100 episodes to 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 really kind of start growing up as as, as an actor and, and learning the lessons that the industry had been trying to teach me for so long what do you mean when you say that? Growing up as an actor. Um, well, I was I was trained in the theater, um, and for the longest time, I was trying to apply what I believed was uh, my job, trying to do my job, which is to <laughs> essentially uh, deliver my lines in the same fashion on the same mark every night. So that my co-stars and my my fellow actors could depend on me to know that that line comes out when I pick up that letter opener and you know that kind of thing. So um, I was working quite a bit, but still kind of got caught in in um, my ideas of what needed to to be in that performance. Um, it wasn't until. Jeez, I don't even know when, but it's it, it always feels like a lesson I just learned, which is my job as a, as a film and television actor is to give the editors a bunch of stuff to work with. You know, <laughs> before I was trying to do the best performance from action to cut, you know, and, you know, have it all be there. And it's like, you know what, it, it doesn't, it's not all in there. It's all in all the takes. And then they will determine what all of it is. So it took me a while to grow up as an actor and realize that my job is to provide footage for the editor. Now, um, now, how did Army Wives come? Good, sorry. 
when I see young actors now and I see them on set and they, you know, um, that often is the case with, with guest stars and stuff on, on Special Victims or various other shows, I always try to impart that a little bit. It's like, look, your job is to just give them a different take each time. Don't change your intention so much. Don't try and change the language. Just change how you come into it and see where it goes so that you're providing the editors with options because they love options. So how did Army Wives come about? <laughs> uh, yeah, curiously enough, it, it, uh, Army Wives was a, was an audition request. It came across my desk uh, just like anything else. It's like you... Um, you know, uh, Marcy Phillips over at ABC wants to audition you for this role. And uh, I read the breakdown and everything, and I'm like, hard-ass Army officer? I know that guy. I was raised by that guy, you know? Um, the dude's name was even Frank. My dad's name is Frank. He was a, a hard-ass Army major. And my dad, before he was a hard-ass Army colonel, was a hard-ass Army major. So I was like, I got this. Um so it was an in-person audition. I went in and I read with Marcy. Um, and she thought it was great. I felt pretty damn comfortable about it. And then I got a call from my agent. It's like, oh, they'd love to fly you out to L.A. to do um, a screen test for for this, this show. Very exciting. So I flew out to L.A. and they put me up. And I, I, I went and did a screen test. And they're more of like a chemistry read. Um, but... They, oh, I've forgotten this very important element of the story, which was when I got out there, they said, okay, we'd like you to read for the role of uh, the general instead of, you know, Frank Sherwood. I forget. Jeez, it's been so long I've forgotten the general's name, the part that Brian McNamara played. Um, at any rate, uh, so I, I do this little chemistry read with, with Kim Delaney. Um, and uh, I thought it went really well. And I, I go back to my hotel and I get a call from my agent saying, oh, well, Terry, I'm sorry, but it's just not going to go any further. They just, you know, just not. So I did uh, what any reasonable person would do is I, I got drunk and I threw myself around my hotel room in despair and self-loathing. <laughs> I woke up with these unexplainable bruises and I just uh, and my agent calling me saying, hey, um, the reason it wasn't going any further with that one is because they saw you so clearly as Major Sherwood that they just want to cast you in that. And I'm like, well, you know, lucky that I didn't punch holes in the walls and, you know, owed the hotel money. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that before, before I have this massive headache? Um, so I was fortunate enough to uh, to get to play Catherine Bell's husband for seven seasons on, uh, on Army Wives at that point. Moved down to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, Major changes occurred in my life at that time. I got separated and then divorced and moved to South Carolina. And, you know, my, uh, you know all the attendant kind of uh, confusion and, and, and uh, whatnot as a result of all that. Now, what is it like as an actor when, you know, when did you know after every season, when did you know you were getting picked up for the next season? Because as it says, you know, you, when you become a series regular, you know you have that check coming in you know you have a job to go to so mm -hmm. with army wives was it originally when did you know during the seasons when you were getting picked up because you ran for a long time it did. it did we were fortunate enough to run for seven seasons which is really rarefied air we're in very good very good company of shows that have run that long um when i first booked the show they booked me as a as a, a recurring role um but i think that they when they first started the show, they, they assumed it was going to be driven primarily by the storyline of the wives, hence army wives. But without the husbands, the context of the soldiers, without the context of the soldiers and spouses um, that are serving, the, the army wives uh, lacked punch. So uh, they, they brought the men into the story more, the soldiers more into the story. So the second season, I, I became a series regular. Um, and then uh, after, the, and, and so I had to move down to South Carolina basically to be available to shoot. Uh, my family still lived in New York. Um, so after season two, we got a quick, or, you know, in the middle of season two, we got a pick up for season three. And it's like, great. So I was like, well, I'll move my family down to South Carolina because we're going to be down here shooting this thing. And then 
the end of season three, we didn't get a pickup. We didn't get a pickup, and we didn't get a pickup, and I'm sitting there looking at my wife, and I'm like, well, what are we going to do? So we moved the family back to Beacon, and then we got picked up, and so I moved back to South Carolina. Um, and, you know, this business, like the Army, can be hard on marriages, so it, 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 uh, that's not the business that, that, that rendered that asunder. There were various other elements involved. Um, but um, we, we generally got the pickup on that show while we were either still shooting or just after we had finished shooting. Um, because I think they wanted to make sure that they kept everybody locked in. Um, and then there was one season, I forget what season it was, where they weren't sure if we were going to get picked up again. So they, they just they paid us extra to extend the season for 10 episodes. And that became uh, the beginning of the next season, uh, what might have been the entire next season. And then it just disappeared. It's like we, they, we shot season seven. We brought in a bunch of new faces as... The army does, so it makes perfect sense. Um, some of the original cast had cycled out, and we brought in some new faces, and it was, you know, it was, it was going relatively well. But then Lifetime changed hands in terms of ownership. I think it went from ABC to to Disney or something. I, I'm not exactly sure, but it was it, it happened at a at a, a corporate level, and. Um, Regardless of the success of Army Wives, I think the new ownership wanted to imprint their their own kind of DNA on the new lifetime, um, the rebranding. And so uh, we did not get picked up. We did not continue. Um, and there really was, it was kind of left in the air. There was there was no real closure to the show. There wasn't this the, the writing that would support that, okay, this is going to be the, the series ender, anything like that. Um, and honestly, I think that that show could probably still be going today um, because, you know, I grew up in the military. Every three years you moved. Your dad got stationed somewhere else and they brought somebody else in who lived in your house, you know. Uh, so it would have been easy enough to just have this kind of rotating cast or this, this moving cast and just continue to, uh, to, to mine uh, the experience of, of growing up in the armed forces um, and bringing that to the screen, I think that's one of the things we did so successfully was to was to show what it is that the families go through uh, being married to the army. Now, do you hit some depression after that? Because it's it, it's like your family. You moved down there. You've been with these people for seven seasons, so you probably you know the crew. You know you yeah. know the you know the crafty person. You know the the you oh, know yeah. all that. So you get to know them, and and it's. And I've talked to people who said it's like a family. You feel like a family because everyone's everyone's in a good mood because their jobs are secure. It's not like you're walking yes. walking on eggshells. So no. when it comes when it hits you, it smacks you right in the ass no. out of nowhere. What what did you go through? I mean, was it was it something? Did you were you pissed? Were you upset? Because as you said, it could have been going for a long time, and you know the military life, so you 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 know it more than the actual people who are from the network. You know how it works. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was it was upsetting to say the least. I mean, I, you, you get very used to to having a job, and you forget what it is to be um, continually without one. Um, and we were all down there in Charleston, which is a beautiful town, um, and we were all like just uh, kind of perennially on location. We were, it was like this, this, uh, we became one another's friends and playmates and cohorts and we'd golf together and go bowling together and we'd do, you know, have picnics together. We, we were all, we hung out a lot. Um, and of course we got to know all the crew cause they were local. Um, so when the show left town, um, I stayed, I, I, I had, um, at that point, I had fallen in love with a, with a, with this woman, and and you know, well, my entire life used to fit in my Volvo station wagon. All of a sudden, I'm buying furniture, so things changed for me. Um, and then I then I, I booked another show called The Inspectors, uh, which was actually shooting in Charleston, which is surprising since Army Wives was the only game in town when we were there, and The Inspectors was basically the only game in town while we were there. Um, but this was a Saturday morning. Uh, 
educational and informational like kids show. Um, it was, uh, it's called the inspectors it's based on the postal inspection service, which is the oldest federal law enforcement agency in the country grew out of the pony express. Um, and the post office apparently had a relationship with the producer. He had done some, some, uh, public service spots for them or something. And so they said, they went to him and they said, look, we spend all this money every year making these posters to put up in the, in the, the, the post offices to, to explain to people the various things that can, that, that can be of danger to them in the mail and what they should and shouldn't do and things like that. How about if we give you that money that we're spending on these damn posters that nobody reads and we make a TV program? And we, you know, we, we do a half hour procedural about uh, stuff that the Postal Inspection Service has, uh, wants people to know. And so uh, we did that for four seasons. And I directed seven of those episodes. It was a half hour uh, family, light family procedural. It was a really uh, it was scripted. It was a very odd kind of bird to have on, uh, on CBS on a Saturday morning. Uh, but it, it did pretty well. It, I got a, a daytime Emmy nomination for it, and it, it won several daytime Emmys for you know it was it was good programming. And then that just disappeared. They just uh, it packed us up at the end of season four because we had to vacate the studio space that had been leased to someone else. And they're like, all right, we'll just pack it up and put it in the in the shipping containers, and we'll we'll store it, and then we'll we'll move it to the to wherever we end up, and we just never heard again. So. What made what you decide? Industry. What made you decide to direct? Did they ask you, or is it something that you had wanted to do? When they first approached me about doing the inspectors, uh, they wanted me to be the the oh, very similar to the character I play now, the guy that shows up in the big black car, yells at everybody to do their job, and then leaves. You know, um, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay, I can do that. That sounds great. Um, but I want to, uh, I want to direct. Yeah, that's it. You know, <laughs> it's like I'll do it, but I'm gonna direct. <laughs> like, okay and then uh we started they started working on the, the the episodes and they they came back and asked me if i'd play uh, one of the leads and i said sure but uh the directing stuck so i managed to uh to uh kind of cut my teeth on seven episodes of that show which was a trial by fire because it was a half hour show and by the time we got into our fourth, se our third season. They were giving us two and a half days to shoot one episode. Um, so there were days when I would shoot eleven scenes. I mean, just flying, just flying. And it's, uh, guest stars would come in mostly from Atlanta, and I'd say, "Look, just so you know, we move very quickly. So if I've got it, I am moving on. It's no reflection on you. If you desperately feel like you need another take, let me know. But if I feel like I've got it, I've got to move on because I've got." seven other scenes to shoot before lunch you know <laughs> yeah. like that kind of shit. <laughs> so after that you know you, you look at your imdb you've worked on some really for your career some great shows but in the last you know years uh designated survivor how did that mm -hmm. role come about what and it's and you working with Kiefer? I mean, what is that what is that like for you uh well designated survivor was 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 a real uh was really sweet because um Jeff Melvoin, who was the showrunner on Army Wives, became the showrunner on Designated Survivor. And uh, I just, I had shot him an email one day just just because we'd become friendly enough to be able to email back and forth. And I was like, you know, how are you doing? What's going on? You know? Um, and he said, uh, why don't you audition for the show? And so uh, they sent me an audition for, for Designated Survivor, and I, I booked it, and I ended up doing like seven or eight episodes of that. I um, was very fortunate uh, to get an opportunity to travel up to Toronto and shoot that. Um, the way the show was set up, the way my character was set up in the storyline, I really did. I didn't work with Kiefer. I was always like in some bunker somewhere. I was always the guy they couldn't find, you know. Uh, so I, I, I spent a lot of time... Um, with with me on set alone. <laughs> um, also at the time, geez, I had a my my knee was all blown out, so I was hobbling around on crutches for a good part of that. Was that from doing stunts, or how'd you blow your knee out? Uh, geez, that time that was uh, that time. Oh yeah, I was just I was I think I was running and I just hit a low spot and my hyperextended and just went and squished my meniscus, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I, 
I've had both of my knees operated on, yeah. Now, now the also Yellowstone. Tell me about your experience on Yellowstone, because these are these are popular, popular shows you're on. These are big shows. These are big shows. I've been very, very, very fortunate to work on some of the shows that I've worked on with, some of the people that I've worked on. There's no doubt about that. Um, Yellowstone, again, was a, was an audition that was that was sent to me as a, an audition request, a self-tape. Um, and I think they booked me before they booked... Um, geez... Why do I always blank on the, the man who played my brother, Neil McDonough, um, who's, you know, got these big, bright blue eyes and is just that intense dude. What a wonderful man, too. He's really sweet. Um, but uh, that was just a, that was that was an audition that, that went my way. And um, so I got an opportunity to work with Kevin Costner and and uh, and Cole Hauser. My God, he's just so perfect for that role at Rip. Just unbelievable. And we were shooting in Park City, Utah, the first se- or the second season, which is the season that I was in. Uh, me and Neil McDonough played brothers who were trying to to take uh, the Dutton Ranch from, from Kevin Costner's character and his family, which was a no-no. They, they dealt with us in the way they dealt with all their other problems, which was generally just shoot first and ask questions later. Um it's, 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 man, just great storytelling, beautiful place to shoot. My sister actually lives in Park City, so I got to see her quite a bit. We shot up in Montana as well. Um, yeah, it was a, a, a great experience. I love being in the mountains. I would love to actually live out that way, but my life is here in, in New York. Well, you're, you're getting these parts, though, you know, and you're getting a little bit of a run, like flight attendant. You know, how did that come about? Because once again, you're getting these, it's like you're, it's like you're on the precipice of like, you probably said there go, just make me a goddamn series regular, or just give me a role to put it, instead of casting me for something that's going to recur, you know me, just give me the series regular. But that Flight Attendant, what was, what was, your, what, what was yeah, your experience I, on was, that show? There was a period of time there when I was shooting uh, The Flight Attendant, um, Mosquito Coast, Homeland, and Hightown, all at the same time as recurring guest star and I don't know man if uh, it'd be great if they just start casting me as a series regular I, I would I would love that in fact that's 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 my plan at this point if anybody's listening um no a uh, flight attendant was was again it was a, an audition that went my way I, I got an audition uh put in a self-tape Actually, I think I did that one in person, now that I think about it. Um, that might have been one of my last in-person auditions. Because um, that was just before COVID. Because uh, our s- second season, or... Yeah, they shot that, for a part of that first season in Thailand. And I think, like, Rosie got COVID in Thailand or something like that. Very, very early on. Um at any rate, that was, again, just an audition that, that came my way through my agency, and, and uh, it went my way. Um, yeah, same with same with Hightown, same with, with Mosquito Coast, same with uh, just about... I mean, there have been a couple episodes here and there where I've just gotten an offer where, you know, the agent will call and say, hey, I've got an offer for you. Fantastic. What is it? Well, it's this asshole who comes in and yells at people and then gets back in his big black car and goes home. You know, oh, okay, yeah, it's a, it's a one episode guest star spot with a possible recurring. Oh, okay, you know, it's more money than I had yesterday. Now, now tell me about Cobra Kai because that's an intense scene, and dude, you're you're jacked in that scene, like you're ripped. Like, I mean, seriously, I mean, did you, how? Did, I guess it worked for you because you are you know stunts, but that's 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 a real. Tell me, can I, take me through that scene. Because it's a physical scene, and I didn't know then that you did stunts. But you know, uh, did you did you have to like? Are you always that ripped, or did you just like get ripped? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I've always been athletic. Um, in fact, I, I I look at that that footage from Cobra Kai, and I was like, oh my god, I was carrying around so much weight in that. Uh, I've actually lost about twenty pounds since then, um, and now I now I box every morning. Um, but uh, I, I had taken uh, karate many years ago when my son was young. 
Um, and I was taking him to karate. I was like, well, I can't just sit around and do nothing. I'll do it too. Um, but I, you know, I, I got like a second belt. I went from yellow to orange or something. I never, you know, kind of pursued that. Um, but when Cobra Kai came across my desk, I was like, what is this? You gotta be kidding me. Um, I, I, I thought it was just kind of silly. And so I said, yeah, you know, but it looks, it looks like fun. I'll, I'll, sure, I'll do the audition. So again, I did an audition. It went my way. They decided to cast me in that role. It wasn't an offer. Um, and uh, I got there. Uh, we were shooting in Atlanta. And um, we were on set. And they said, uh, okay, well, let's go find some space and work out the choreography. It's like, okay. <laughs> so... Uh, they, they choreographed this whole fight scene on the bridge there, um, in the space of about, uh, we rehearsed it for about a half an hour, an hour, and then, then it basically went up there and did it. Um, and I suppose it's through the, the, the trickery of, of camera angles and things like that, that it looked as good as it did. I think the, the fact that I'm, uh, pretty athletic and had some, uh, karate prior to. And when I knew that I was going to do that, uh, a fight scene, I went into a friend of mine at the gym that I worked out and we spent two hours just kind of refreshing, you know, some stuff in case I, you know, so I didn't look like a total fool. Um, and it came out looking really great. And I, I had no idea that Cobra Kai was, was such a popular thing or that it was garnered the attention that it did. Um, but people love that show, um, and it's it's remarkable how well written it is, and how they managed to take that iconic movie, the movie series, and those characters, and then to bring them forward in time like that. It's it's really a testament to some very creative people, and um, I've been I've been very very proud to have been a part of it, and that, that people identify with it so much. Now. Back to SVU. Are you done? Are you done on that show? Because the last time we saw you, you, you had a you had a gun on Doogie Hauser's best friend son. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like it was like a total breakdown. Like you, you know, you and that's the thing about about the character. You you are a hard ass, and but they address that you had some anger issues. They 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 address that stuff. But then at the uh -huh. end, that's the last thing. I mean, we, me and my wife were saying, he, yeah, he might freak a little. We never thought you were going to come out running out with a gun. I mean, we never thought you'd like, be freaking out. But, I mean, did, did you know that was coming up? Like, what was the build-up to you sitting there all of a sudden getting, you know, in trouble? <laughs> well, I got, I got a call, uh, you know, and, and they said, look, we're not writing you out, but... <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, it's like... It's like uh, your character is going to go through something here um, that's going to get him in trouble with uh, with the administration uh, within the police department, um, and he's going to he's going to get demoted. I said, "Oh, oh, okay." Um, and while I have not heard personally um, if I've actually been demoted or not. <laughs> um, I know that uh, the character has, I was, my, my character was like the acting uh, head of SVU uh, Manhattan. So I was the uh, Olivia's Uber boss as well as just her immediate uh, supervisor. Well, that immediate supervisorship has gone to another character at this point. I think she's, I don't know if she's already been introduced or if she's coming up. Um, and what happens with my character, I honestly, I don't know. I really, I really don't. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, that I'm done. But uh, this was only supposed to have been a couple episodes in the first place, so I have no idea. You know, uh, now because you're on these shows, do you get recognized a lot? I mean, or, or do you get like that? Or you're that guy? I mean, do you because you've been on popular shows? I'm sure Cobra Kai, everyone watches it, but a whole probably a group of young kids now know of you because they're like, right. oh yeah, oh yeah. And you know how it is, and flight attendants a different demographic than Law and Order. I mean, you you've 
you've gone over a lot of different demographics. Army wives is different than designated survivor. So you, you sure. really play to a wide audience. Do you get recognized a lot? I, 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 I do. Um, not, not a ton. Um, and also living in New York, I think uh, people are, you know, they mind their own business. <laughs> um, you can see the look of recognition in people's eyes. Sometimes you see somebody that's just like, oh, or, or will literally say something, and I'm I'm always kind of touched that people uh, want to reach out. That, that means that that they've made a connection that, um, and they just they 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 just want to kind of acknowledge that connection, and that's that's great. That's one of the beautiful things of our industry. Um, I, I recognized in the airports. Uh, it was it happened quite a lot for Army Wives because the the fan base there was so so dedicated to those characters that I would, I would get accosted for, for being mean to my wife on that show or for saying, you know, I can't believe you said that to her. It's like, I, it, lady, it's, it's not me. You know, it's, it's my, okay, never mind. You know, can't believe you've got her on a sex schedule. How dare you? I'm like, well, I, it's not me. It's, that always cracks me up when people, you know, there's a story where people like try to beat up James Garner during the Rocker Files to see if he's really a tough guy. It's like, no, no I just, I, I write this. Now, in your career, what, what character that you played are you most proud of? Is there one that you are very proud of? I mean, you've played so many great characters. Um, well, I got to tell you, uh, Frank Sherwood from Army Wives is, is, is right up there. Um, I got an opportunity to play uh, my dad. In, in so many ways, um, but to be able to play um, a soldier, a U.S. Army soldier who had such high moral and ethical character and, and uh, was just trying to do the right things with his family and, and, and do his duty to his country, um, I was very proud of that. And working in that capacity... Uh, as Frank Sherwood, I think made me uh, a better person. Um, there's a movie that I shot called Mine Nine um, about coal miners uh, and a, a, a coal mine coal mining disaster and explosion that occurs underground and we get we get trapped. Um, that was a really rigorous, short, um, independent film shoot. And uh, it was, you know, I was the, the number one on the call sheet, so I was carrying that, that burden. Um, but I feel very proud of that, that particular piece. It was, it was, uh, it was quite an undertaking. I'm very, very proud of, of the way that I came out. Um, I think uh, Yellowstone was some good work. See, I really, I really thought that that my work in High Town was pretty good, but that I, I loved doing the Boston dialect, so that's that was great. I love doing dialect work; that's always so much fun. Um, boy, there's there's things I wish I had to do over again, you know, like going back to Donnie Brasco and all those years ago. Uh, but hell, I was I was young, and and uh, you know, what a great what a great opportunity that was. And I worked with Pacino another couple of times after that. Now, so, you know. Those are the things you're proud of. When you look back, when you look back at your career, what are some things that are just you instill in your memory? Like you go, holy crap. Like, I mean, working with Pacino and Depp on your first movie is like a, oh, wow, holy shit moment. But what are just something yeah. that made you, that you look back and go, no matter the rejection, no matter what, what an actor goes through, is people don't know. Like, actors have it harder than any salesman out there. Like, you guys go through... Addition. But looking back, what has made this, your career path, made it a few things that just has made it worth it? Worth be able to say at the end of the day, I'm a working actor, and this is what I do. There's been ups, there's been downs, but what did you look back and say, man, this, this makes it all worthwhile? Being able to say that, being able to say that I'm a working actor and that I've been able to uh, support my, my family uh, for all these years as a working actor. Um, but there were, for instance, um, during Army Wives, there were a couple of times when uh, two, 
two times I can remember where a woman approached me and said, uh, your show really helped us get through our son's funeral. Um, that, um, cause their, 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 their sons both happened to have been in the service and were killed in the line of duty. Um, and that, that really strikes you. And it really, really struck me that this is, uh, this, this industry, this business touches people in a way that, uh, cannot be underestimated and cannot be trivialized. It has to be given respect and it has to be given uh, reverence to a certain degree because it's, while we're used to kind of playing in the, the, the realm of the emotional as actors, um, for the general public, um, if they connect to the material, they connect to us, they connect to the storyline on an emotional level then that is that is a, an honor um, and that has to be given its its due respect um, yeah I think uh, moments like that um, it's just it's just moments you know it's like when you're um, staying on years ago with after a Sidney Lumet movie um, find me guilty with Vin Diesel came out it was a true story about mobsters who were being tried under the RICO Act and one of the mobsters de decided to defend himself and was actually quite successful. <laughs> um, and so it's a Sidney Lumet movie and I'm, I'm playing a, 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 what was I, CIA or something or FBI and I'm testifying and I say, you know, hey, he asked, how did, how'd you know these guys were, were, were mobsters, were Italians? I said, you know, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, chances are it's a duck. So I'm standing on 8th Avenue outside of the Penn Station at one point or something, and this truck rolls by, and a guy leans out the window and says, Hey, quacks like a duck. <laughs> it's like, okay, okay. It's like, you're that guy, right? It's just, you know, the, the, the little connections that, you, that, that people want to make uh, with someone that they saw in a movie or on TV or, you know, um, that, that makes it worthwhile. All right. And, well, just, and just the sense that, uh, you know, I was a terrible roofer. Uh, so I'm really glad that I've, I found something that I do pretty well. Exactly. I want to thank you for coming on. What do you have coming up? Any, any projects coming up? Uh, well, I just, I, I just uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, putting together my electronic press kit. Uh, as Since we came out of the strike, things have not... Um, really ramped up. I did a couple episodes of uh, the best of you to finish up uh, that character arc, I guess. Um, so, you know, I'm auditioning, looking for the next gig, looking for the next gig. Um, I think I've got an episode of power coming out. Uh, I don't think that's aired yet. That was shot a long time ago. I just don't think it's aired yet. Um, yeah, but people can go on IMDB and check out. I, I just I made this fun, real uh, career retrospective reel. Um, which is fun. Everything from like my first all in the, all my children episode, all the way up through you know uh, SVU, um, but just it's like three minutes of of my career. It's fun. Still, people go go to go look up Terry Sharper. Go go watch all his old shows. You know, you might get some residuals. Yeah. You go, you watch it. You give him a little cash. Yeah. Watch his uh, watch his uh, retrospective. Uh, people, you can go to my website coopertalk.net. dot net. You can find uh, nine hundred and ninety eight episodes there. You can email me at cooper at cooper talk net at cooper at cooper talk dot net. Twitter, I'm at cooper talk. Instagram, I'm at cooper talk one. And if you're in the South Jersey or Philly area, March thirtieth, come to Laughs and Lyrics at Studio sixty seven in Metford. I'll be doing. 20 minutes of stand-up, followed by Nigel Bennett, who played for the uh, members, an 80s English uh, new wave band. He'll be doing an electric acoustic set for 30 minutes. Then we'll do a 20-minute conversation about his time in the music in the 80s. And he's really good friends with Adam Clayton from U2, so it's going to be a great night. You can email me to get uh, details of that. It's $20 ahead, and it's BYOB. So once again, uh, check out Terry Serpico. I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you next time.